Hello, this is our eighth video in our uh, mini series probability measure. Um, probably should say not so many mini series. Uh, we're going to look at random variables. We're going to do a, a simple example and then jump right into the theory. So our example is that we're going to flip a coin four times. And so our sample space are these four tuples of possible outcome. We have a probability space associated with that and we're going to let X be a function, it's a set function from S to R, so it takes the sets in this, our sample space, and creates a number. And we're going to let it be the number of heads observed for each of these outcomes. So for example, H or X of this four tuple is four, X of this four tuple is one, because there's only one flip of a head. Now, I'm, I'm Caddy Wampus in the paper because I don't want to look at this part just yet. But this is an illustration of what's going on. We have S which is our sample space of all possible outcome and then X takes sets in our sample space and puts them in some other set, call it T, which is a subset of R. And each one, each element here maps to one element here and that's what that's the definition of a function now it can map to the same element but it only maps to one and that means that this isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one function it's just a function and um, that's it and so that's what we're doing we're taking elements of our sample space and mapping them to a number and that's our our um, that's X um, I'm not going to quite call it a random variable yet. Um, here, now, I think a lot of videos I've watched online don't really talk about the inverse image of, a, of this function. But whenever you talk about random variables, you, you have to discuss the inverse image. Most will say that X is a Borel measurable function from the sample space to the real line. But what does Borel measurable mean? And, and, and I think that's glossed over, and we're going to touch upon it. But to do that, we have to talk about the inverse image. <coughs> um, and it really means, that, so the inverse image of zero, it means what elements in here are mapped to zero? Well, there's only one. So this element, or this set of subsets, is the inverse image of zero. The inverse image of four is just this one element. The inverse image of one are these four points, so it's this set. So these, these four elements, or this set, is the inverse image of one. Uh, we can also talk about unions, the inverse image of zero union four. So what, what elements here get mapped to zero or four well it's these two right here okay and that kind of gives you a, a, a an idea of what we're going to discuss about so we have elements in our sample space that are mapped to the real number line or to some other set and that through X and then but we can also talk about the inverse image of these elements in here and that's what this is. Okay, so let's jump in. So some general concepts. Um, we're going to let this be a probability space. And we're going to let script T be another space. So we're going to have a, a function X that maps from S to T. Okay, and we're going to talk about the inverse image of T. Um, of course, this is under X and we're going to denote it by this here. So for, for subsets of T, or elements in T, what's the inverse image of it in S? So this notation, or this element, lives in S. T lives in T, the inverse image lives in S. Okay, so um, for each uh, event in T, so each subset, each element in T, the inverse image of it 
is all the elements in S such that it those are mapped to T. And that's the inverse image. And, if, and for a picture of it is this. So if we have a, a set T1, the inverse image is all the elements that are mapped to it. We can even talk union. So we take T2, union T3, the inverse image of T2 union T3 is this right here. Okay. Now there's some properties, and we won't prove them all, but we'll prove some. And 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 these are just properties of the definition. And so the union of of sets in T are actually the union of the the inverse images of each set. So the union of these, the inverse images, you just take the image of the union of the inverse images. Um, if, if sets are, are disjoint over here, their inverse images are disjoint. Um, this notation is actually the same as this. We interchange summation and union. And so this is just showing you that, hey, they're the same. Um, number four, we, we can talk about intersections. The intersections of, of sets in T is the intersection of the inverse images of the individual sets in T. Um, the inverse image of T complement is the inverse image of T complement. In inverse image of the whole space over here is the whole space S. And the inverse image of the empty set is the empty set over here. So let's prove let's prove a couple of these. Um, here, um, by definition, this is the inverse image of T complement. So it's all the elements of S such that uh, that S is not mapped to T. That's what this means. And it, well, if, if it's not mapped to T, that means it's in T complement. Well, all S such that X of S is in T complement that's the inverse image of T complement. And so those two are equal. So that was a proof of five. Proof of four, um, the intersection of, in, the inverse image of the intersection of sets TJ. Well, this here we can look, we can do De Morgan's law, and which is this. And then we just showed that this, we can take this complement out of the set. And that was by what we just showed there. Then um, here, the um, by number one that we showed before, the the inverse image of the union of TJ complements is going to be the union of the inverse images of each of the TJ complements. And then by De Morgan's law, the union of sets complement is the same as the intersection of the individual sets complement. Well, but then we just showed that that could be taken in, which gets rid of that, and that shows you that those two are equal. Okay. Well, that's a couple proofs in the interest of time. We're not going to go on, but they're, but they're, the sim they're similar. So let's let D be a sigma field of subsets of T. So this is in the image of X, T is. We're going to create a subset, a sigma field of subsets of this. And we're going to define the inverse image of this sigma field. Now remember, D lives in T, but the inverse image of D lives in S. So it has to be um, sets in S such that there's an inverse image associated with the, the T in the sigma field. So for every, for some T in our sigma field, there's an inverse image of it, and we're going to call that A, and that A lives in, in the, uh, the sample space, okay? So note that if the T itself is an element of D, remember a D is a sigma field of T, so the, the entire set has to be in here, and we prove that in, the, in our video on sigma fields. So since D, since T is in D, the inverse image of T 
is S, which is a subset which is an element in S, so it has to be a, a subset or an element in the inverse image of D. So this, this is not empty. It's not empty. So and if we let an ele this element be in the inverse image of D for some T in D, then let's see if it's complements in it. So that says let's this complement, remember because this element's in the inverse image, um, but one of the properties says we can take that in, which is what this is, but this has to be an element of the inverse image of D because T complements in D. If T is in D, T complements in D because it's a sigma field. So if the element, if this is in the inverse image, it's complements in the inverse image. Now we can also look at um, if these elements are all in the inverse image of D, and that's for every TJ in D, let's look to see if the union of those sets or these inverse image, these elements are in the inverse image of D. Well, this can be rewritten like this from uh, property number one, but this is in the inverse image of D because this set is in D. Because D is a sigma field, if all these TJs are in it, then the union has to be in it because it's a sigma field. So that says this union is in the inverse image of D. So why did we go through these? Well, these are, if these three properties are satisfied, then this is a sigma field. And that's um, theorem nine, that the class inverse image of D is a sigma field in S, okay? Now that's important, super, super duper important. D is a sigma field in T, and the inverse image of D is a sigma field in S, okay? Why is that important? Well, that means that, um, it means that X is measurable, okay? So if the M, so if we take a sigma field D in T, and the inverse image of those sets is a subset of the sigma field in our original probability space, then X is measurable. Specifically, you should say UD measurable. Remember, D is in T and U is in S. Um, but usually you just say measurable. So X is measurable, okay? Now, that was generically for any any space T. But if our space is the real number line and our sigma field associated or you know on this T or on R is the Borel sigma field, then X is U Borel measurable, or sometimes just Borel measurable. And if that's the case, then X is a random variable, okay? So, um, and so this is where they say if X is a Borel measurable function, then it's a random variable. But it's much deeper than that. It's saying that the image of X has to be the real number line and there, there's a sigma field, the Borel sigma field associated with that and if this in if the inverse image of the Borel set is in the sigma field of our original probability space, then X is a random variable. Okay. And this also is for compound experiments too. So if the image of X is k-dimensional and we have a k-dimensional Borel sigma field then X is U, B, uh, Borel, K-dimensional Borel measurable. Um, X is a K-dimensional random vector, okay? Um, so let's, let's look at a, a theorem here that, um, so let's say we have some class of subsets of T. And then, um, but we're going to do it in a unique way. The T's in the the subsets of T 
are such that the inverse image of t is some element in the in the uh, sigma field of our original probability space. Okay, then c star is a sigma field. Okay, um, and we're not going to prove it in the interest of time, but it follows directly from the properties of one through seven of the inverse image. Okay, so. Why is this important? This is important when we define um, random variables. Okay, so uh, x is a random variable if the um, remember. So x is a random variable. So we have to be talking about the real number line or the k-dimensional, you know, real number line by default. But then if we take a subset of the Borel, the Borel sigma field, the Borel sets, and the inverse image of that is in, in is a subset of the uh, sigma field in our original sample space, then X is Borel measurable, and it's a random variable. And so almost always, well, let me rephrase that. Everything that we're going to do in this mini-series and most books you assume that you're dealing with the Borel sigma field. And um, and that's why you say X is Borel measurable, because we're dealing with the Borel sigma field. And this here was defined in video number four when we looked at measures, uh, measure spaces. Okay, so with, with that brief background, let's let's just jump right into this. So let's let X be a function a Borel measurable function from our sample space or this probability space to the k-dimensional reals and there is a k-dimensional Borel sigma field associated with that and k is greater than or equal to 1. So on this Borel sigma field let's define a function q on sets of in this Borel sigma field to be this, that the prob this is equal to the probability of the inverse image of B. Okay, then Q is a probability measure on this uh, sigma field, BK. Um, here's a little proof. So let's let B be an element of the sigma field. And QB is actually defined as the probability of this inverse image. But because this, we're talking about our original probability space, and this is a probability measure, that it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So that says that Q is positive, or non-negative, I should say. So now we need it so that Q on the entire sample space is one. So Q of R, um, by definition, is um, the, the probability of the inverse image of RK, that you know, our entire sample space. But we showed in um, that was uh, property number six that that is the probability that this is S. And the probability of S is one because that's a probability measure. Okay, so it's one. Now let's look at a countable disjoint sets. So let's look at the sum of BJs that are pairwise disjoint. So that's the probability of the inverse image of this union or this you know addition of these sets. Um, but we showed in um, property three that you can take that sum out. It's the sum of these inverse images. But because this is a probability measure, it is sigma additive. So we can take the sum out front. Well, the probability of the inverse image of BJ, well, that's how we define Q. So it's the sum of these Qs. So Q is sigma additive. So Q satisfies all the properties of a probability measure. So it is a probability measure. Well, Q is called a probability distribution function. And this is the start of, of PDS. So Q of X, and we use the X whenever there is, um, you know, we're unsure. 
you know, of what the random variable is. But we leave it off if we're sure. And really, the, it's the de defined as the probability of the inverse image of B. So that's all the elements in our sample space that belong, you know, that are mapped to B with our random variable. You know, it's often written just as X is in B. And really, it's the probability that all the S in our sample space that are mapped to this event B. Okay, so we have one more. And, and here, I, I wish I had, you know, two hours to go over this stuff as opposed to 15, 20 minutes. So let's let K be uh, gr greater than or equal to 1. And we're going to let Z be this uh, K tuple. It's a vector. Then the random variable, and that's supposed to be a bold X because it's a k-dimensional. It's discrete if for each element in our sample space, such that if we add them all up, we get 1. And we're going to set f of z to be this q function. Well, f is called a probability mass function. You know, and it can you can look at it like this. The probability that x is in the event b is the sum of all the elements of B, you know, times this probability measure. Okay, that's sort of how we define that it's discrete. In a continuous setting, um, X is our random variable X, Borel measurable function, is continuous if the probability of any one of those points is zero. And that's sort of by definition that you have to have in a continuous setting, each point has to have probability zero because if you sum them up, it would be infinite. But we have to be finite. Matter of fact, the whole sample space has to add to one. And so we have to define it like that. But if we have a non-negative function that goes from the k-dimensional space to the real, you know, the one-dimensional space, um, such that the probability of x being in this... Um, event can be can be thought of as the integral over this function here then f is what's called absolutely continuous and it's a pdf probably a density function okay well that's all i have for today hope you enjoyed it i did i enjoy doing these videos uh, like it subscribe so you don't miss the next one next we're going to look at accumulative distribution functions from a probability measure standpoint. It's going to be pretty exciting. So uh, talk to you later. Bye.